I'd like to tell you about a talented engineer Dmitry Vysotsky who survived the war and left a significant mark in the annals of Soviet gasifier thought. I showed his works in a three-part video about Soviet gasifier vehicles. But not all of them. Here I'd like to show all of his patents. They deserve special attention. At the end of this video, I will show you a transport gasifier that you have not seen anywhere else and are unlikely to see. While other Soviet engineers, such as Mezin, copied Western designs, Vysotsky, his main achievement, of course, was a replaceable and serviceable firebox made of a plate which was very helpful during the war. Blind repetition of foreign engineering ideas in the USSR resulted in the agony related to casting and aluminizing fireboxes. The developers suffered beyond words. These fireboxes could operate no more than six months even in their best versions, i.e. with 8 mm thick walls made of low-carbon aluminized steel. The USSR couldn't cast heat-resistant stainless steel, like in BERT, today. By the way, it is impossible to do this here, too. In our country, stainless steel is not cast due to process complexity. Imbert didn't get very far either, and his firebox, cast from heat-resistant stainless steel, lasted one year, or 40,000 kilometers, before burning out. Most of the cracking was at the neck, the place of the highest thermal stress. In the worst case, if a billet made in the USSR was defective, it would not last even a month, it also burst at the neck. After a failure, the gasifier had to be disassembled and the firebox had to be cut out if anything working was left of it. I have read all the works describing the technology of firebox casting in the USSR. First, it was necessary to select high-quality metal. I delved into how it was done and tried to replicate it in our country. For the firebox to hold up somehow, it was necessary to comply with the exact composition of the steel. It is difficult to do this at foundries even today because raw materials vary in quality due to the poorly observed dosage of elements in the metal. I know what I'm talking about because I worked at a research institute that was located close to the casting institute. I literally spent several years there. I have delved into casting technology to the very depths because of my specialization. Then the firebox had to be annealed to relieve the internal thermal stresses. Then it had to be coated in a special way with a precise thickness of aluminum powder on a specially equipped rotating frame. Then the firebox should be coated with a special crust forming solution. Then it should be annealed once more in the furnace so that the aluminum etch into the steel. It is possible to repeat this today, but to do so you would have to establish a special workshop with machines, equipment, and trained people. You must also have a technical control department with laboratory equipment, otherwise, you will fail. I forgot to tell you that the cast product should have a smooth, flat surface after casting. It must also be bead blasted to be suitable for aluminizing. And in the end, after all these tortures, the firebox burns out after three to six months of daily strenuous use. Vysotsky made another firebox which turned out to be simple and replaceable. In fact, he corrected Imbert's mistakes on the Soviet copy of his device. And then he also designed a gasifier that made my eyebrows go up. I will start showing Vysotsky's patents in order, according to the chronology of his engineering developments. On February 10, 1939, Vysotsky filed a patent for a firebox made as an ordinary flat plate with a hole in the middle. His invention would help greatly in World War II. When the hourglass fireboxes burned out, they were simply cut off, and a pancake with a hole in it made of 8mm sheet metal was installed instead of them. It was enough for 500 hours of operation. The 5mm sheet was enough for 250 hours. But it didn't matter because a disc was thrown away to install a fresh one. The edges were caulked with asbestos. The same applied to a replaceable air supply pipe. At first, it was made of thick-walled water pipe where holes were drilled to create improvised tuyeres. But later, an ordinary not thick-walled water pipe was used. Circles made of 8mm steel were welded at the air outlets. The pipe could also last for 250 hours. Yes, it lasted for one to two months, but the pipe was easy to replace and cost nothing. In wartime, when the fireboxes could not be cast, it helped a lot. Vysotsky filed one more patent on February 22, 1940. Its essence is clear. If the plate cut the height of the reduction zone by half in the previous version, then here the engineer realized his mistake and extended the reduction zone. This method was not used during the war a simple circle was installed instead. In this patent, we see a cone that serves as an improvised lower part of the firebox, like in the Imbert gasifier, in order to stretch the reduction zone, 
which drastically reduced the amount of tar. It apparently took Vysotsky a year to realize that the primary version of his firebox increased the tar content. Mezin made the same mistake when he copied Imbert's device. He decided to get rid of the bottom skirt. This simplified the production of fireboxes and also increased their durability, but the tar content raised dramatically after such trimming. Vysotsky corrected his previous defect with this patent. He filed his next patent after the war, on February 20, 1946. He returned to his original patent with the plate but tried to combine his gasifier into a single unit with the filter. Another year later, on May 22, 1947, Vysotsky tried to solve three problems in one fell swoop, the problem of wet wood and the problem of gas caloric value in addition to the firebox problem. He made a pressurized gasifier with oxygen blast. Let me explain something for those viewers who haven't immediately grasped the meaning of this invention. The USSR never solved the problem of wood drying. It planned to cope with it for a long time but never built dryers or warehouses. Germany, which captured Europe, built 2,000 wood chip warehouses along the routes of gas generator vehicles, at a distance like between petrol stations. But the Soviet Union failed to solve the problem, and the wood was always wet. The second point is pressure. It is known that if a gasifier works under pressure, the amount of methane in it increases dramatically. In an ordinary downdraft gasifier, it is about 1%, but under pressure, it immediately jumps to about 16%. Methane is the most desirable gas in a gasifier. It gives the most power, but even this was not enough for Vysotsky. He wanted to get rid of ballast nitrogen, which amounted to 55%, not allowing it to get into engine cylinders. To remove the nitrogen completely, the scientist simply equipped his gasifier with oxygen blast. I don't even know what to say. This is such a bold move for 1947 that it was decades ahead of its time. Moreover, due to this type of gasification, under pressure with oxygen, the gas does not require strong purification and cooling as in conventional gasifiers. According to the researcher, a 6-8 liters tank, where the gas was filtered, was enough. That is, there is practically no tar, and the gas does not come out hot. From what the researcher writes, I understand that he built a prototype unit at the institute and tested it. Let's talk briefly about the structure of the gasifier and its operation. The vehicle gasifier consists of two alternately operating gasifiers. While one is working, the other one is being loaded. Fuel with humidity of up to 35% should be fed in it. It operates with dry ash removal without slagging, because slagging doesn't occur at such temperatures. There was no ash melting. The melting point of wood ash is 1,350 to 1,450 degrees. Apparently, the accurately calculated oxygen blast allowed to reduce this temperature, and fuels with higher ash content can be used in this gasifier. The gas enters an engine through a conventional gas pressure reducer that reduces the pressure from 12 to 0.5 atmospheres. The gasifier ignites from the coal smoldering in it or electrically. The oxygen supply pump is controlled manually, that is, wet. Up to 35% moisture, fuel with high ash content can be loaded into this gasifier to get tar-free and non-hot gas at the output. As for me, this is a very interesting gasifier. Two more patents co-authored by Vysotsky were filed in 1953 and 1968, but they are not about gasifiers. See you soon.